Hi everyone. So uh, here visiting my dad, and since it's a crowded house, I'm recording in the car. Um, but uh, news from the uh, I, I talked about a lot of comics I was gonna show to my daughter, and she went through a couple of them, and uh, I was kind of surprised at her reaction. She actually didn't like Gwenpool because there was no fighting in it. Uh, at the end, it shows uh, to be continued, and it shows next issue with a bunch of you know heroes and it looks like it's going to be a big fight so uh, she was into that she uh she likes super sons okay but didn't like that they were boys uh we talked about um i told her about renew your vows where spider-man has a daughter she kind of didn't believe me <laughs> but anyway uh last night i was going to do my iron fist video and then i went to lay down to record it and i just straight up fell asleep and then like i woke up with the cell phone on my chest so anyway, Iron Fist, um, this is a big one. This is, uh, so I used to be a big, like, arguer on Twitter, and I and I stopped uh, doing that and Twitter because I realized I call Twitter a, a miscommunication device. It's basically, like, I felt like I started to turn into an asshole, and everyone seemed like an asshole, and it's just, it was just Twitter. <laughs> it was just Twitter the whole time. The, my analogy for uh, Twitter is if you went to a bar and you're only allowed to scream at people as your way of talking. And you would just get, you would go in there, and you would just get really tense, and you would leave really tense, like, ah, I hate that place. And everyone's like, why do you hate it? Is it because you hate Muslims? You know what I mean? So uh, I, I really like YouTube, because you can express yourself in as long of a form as you want, and then people can respond in as long of a form as, as they want, and I've just found YouTube... Uh, I just feel like people come off as people on YouTube, whereas on Twitter they come off as cartoons. But anyway, like at the beginning of 2016, <laughs> when the uh, cast, the casting was announced for uh, Iron Fist, it became a huge controversy on Twitter, uh, and kind of uh, uh, fostered by, you know, the like Bleeding Cool and Mary Sue and those type of websites that just kind of instigate problems without solutions. And then, uh, like, the mainstream press. And um, the controversy was that a martial artist was not cast as an Asian. Let me repeat that, because it sounds like I'm making it up. Asians who have been stereotyped as martial artists for, like, a hundred years of cinema. And now it's anti-Asian to not cast an Asian as a martial artist. Um, then we went down <laughs> the whole rabbit hole of cultural appropriation which is uh, something that doesn't exist and is actually a cover. It's basically a, a way for racial segregationists to uh, espouse racial segregation philosophies uh, while calling other people racist. So it's the most fourth dimensional racist chess move you could ever hope to make. So uh, getting back to Iron Fist, Iron Fist was created in, in the early 70s to uh, capitalize on the Kung Fu craze. This is when the Bruce Lee movies were out. This is when um, uh, Walker, Texas Ranger uh, <laughs> first started being famous. Um, and it was it, there was a big uh, growth of it in culture, um, pop culture, songs. Everyone was kung fu fighting. Uh, kung fu was a TV show. And it was just a big craze. The craze lasted for most of the 80s, or most of the 70s. Kind of petered out in the early 80s. It's, it survived several years after the death of of uh, Bruce Lee, um, about eight years afterwards. Uh, so it was a good, you know, you know, decade fad. Uh, so Marvel created two series to capitalize on that fad. They got the rights to um, Sax Romer's um, Fu Manchu, uh, and they did um, uh, uh, Master... <laughs> God, I'm blanking. They did Shang-Chi, a, a Shang-Chi uh, comic. I think it was called Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. Then, they also did Iron Fist. So, uh, Shang-Chi was uh, basically a guy from the Orient, an Asian from the Orient. By the way, that's a minefield right there. you got to use it right. People are not Oriental. The rugs they stand on are Oriental. The area they come from is the Orient, but they are not Oriental. They are Asian. So, people... So, so uh, you can call uh, objects and culture Orient, you can call the land Orient, but you can't call the people Oriental. It's just, it's a, um, my, my uh, metric for racism is intent. 
Do you intend to denigrate people? Do you look down on them? If someone in good faith calls Asians Orientals because they're not up on the current list of things that are offensive and non-offensive, um, it's just one of those things where it's like, it, it's such a fine line. There literally needs to be like a website that just lays it out or a brochure or they call everyone to the town square and they say, hear ye, hear ye. Saying colored person is incredibly offensive. Say person of color, which is like any computer would say that's the exact same thing. Anyway, so um, Iron Fist was created by Roy Thomas. And um, the SJWs made sure to denigrate him and attempt to destroy him when the TV show came out. So um, Roy Thomas created um, Iron Fist. And Iron Fist was built on the stranger in a strange land trope. Very, very common, not just in Western culture, but in all cult cultures. So stranger in a strange land, somebody from where you're from goes to some place where you're not from. It's very exotic to him. He meets, makes a lot of enemies. He makes some friends. He learns some aspects of the culture. In some way, he, he advances. So they do this all the time in Japanese uh, comics. So th there's a whole genre of manga of... Asians and Japanese characters um, doing really good at something Western. So all of a sudden, they'll be, you know, the, the best saxophone player. Oh my gosh, he's from Tokyo. You know, uh, the best uh, basketball player goes to America, and he's from Okinawa. I'm just joking. Mango would never make a character from Okinawa, main character. <laughs> it's so funny. Like, I, there's all this race talk about America being racist. I've traveled the whole world. America is the least racist place in the world and the other other countries are so racist and it, it's just like part of the culture like in germany um in germany like it won't be like a hip-hop club it'll literally say black music on the front of it um they'll literally have guards that will just say oh no we, we have enough turks inside like and germany thinks of it itself as a very progressive place but no i i will swear on a stack of uh, every do denomination's book <laughs> that um, America is the least racist place in the world. So anyway, Stranger in a Strange Land. Um, so Iron Fist. Now, so there became this huge controversy on on Twitter about why why it's better for Iron Fist to be Asian uh, than white. It's absolutely not only does it not only does he need to be white, he needs to be blonde haired. This is very specific. So, the, so they do race bending and, and gender bending and now sexuality bending. And there's a lot of characters that I think it does not matter what the race is. You know, if you want to have Idris Elba play Superman, um, that works. Because there's a ton of black farmers. And especially, you, you just move them over like two states, you have them land in Mississippi, it feels totally natural. Now, if you grew up in you know Montana, it might be a little, eh. There's lots of characters you can race bend. You can make Tony Stark Asian. That's not a problem. You can make um, Peter Parker black or Hispanic or Jewish. Um, that doesn't really fundamentally change the character. But Blade needs to be black. Storm needs to be black. Um, and Iron Fist, Danny Rand, needs to be white. Not just white, but white and blonde. So um, Danny's... It's kind of complicated, and it was changed a lot for the movie, but effectively, Danny's father dragged his whole family on a vision quest. And the funny thing is, I actually saw a black guy on Twitter say this. He goes, only a white dude would bring his family on a vision quest. <laughs> Which I think is actually pretty true. So anyway, the family gets, like, uh, waylaid, uh, kind of, there's, like, uh, some double, uh, there's, like, some corporate shenanigans. Danny ends up the only one alive. He's uh, kind of dragged into this mystical city, for, and then he's there for about 10 years. Then uh, he, he becomes the Iron Fist. He gains a position of, uh, of power and mastery. Then he goes back to um, America, and he tries to get revenge. And there's kind of a cool scene where the guy he's trying to get revenge on, I think he just literally just has a heart attack. So Iron Fist kind of learns like the, the emptiness of revenge, and then he goes to become a hero. Um, a lot of stuff was changed for the, for the movie, which I really like. Um, but, uh, the thing about that is that, um, they actually changed how it was presented and originally it was presented in, okay, so 
Kun Lun has actually always been shown to be mostly Asian, but a mixed people from all over the world. And people of many different races have gotten the Iron Fist. They actually kind of changed how it was presented. Um, it was it was initially presented of just that, hey, Danny, you're here. You're one of many people here. You are an outsider, but there's a lot of outsiders. Um, uh, the Matt Fraction and um, the Car Andrews recent um, series kind of really emphasized that uh, Danny got some extra special attention, as in extra beatdowns and attacks, because he was an outsider, and that's probably why he became the Iron Fist. That makes a lot of sense psychologically. So there's this guy named John Sway, and he wrote a uh, an, a mini series for Marvel, um, uh, not Marvel for Image, like a year or two, or like two years ago. Uh, it had some good art. I think it was Eric Knate on it. And uh, he's kind of a big firebrand. He's kind of like the Saladin Ahmed. He pops up in every uh, conversation having to do with Asian, and he's basically gives himself the official Asian, like, uh, he's like the representative for Asians. He's very angry. He's got a chip on his shoulder. And he was going, really going hammer and tongs, no pun intended, uh, about this issue. And so I uh, I was talking to him. And I was actually kind of like less assholeish than... Um, uh, normal. I was just just using logic. It was like, you, you can't be a stranger in a strange land if your cousin lives there, you know. And then um, him and basically everyone started doing this fake, um, this fake. How do I say it? They're presenting a stance that even they don't believe in, and you can tell they don't believe in it because no one backed it up. And I'm talking people like Kurt Busiek and um, I think Gail Simone, uh, some other um, well-known comic writers. They said. The stranger in a strange land would be an even better twist if he was Asian American, because then you could show him relearning about his culture. Okay, th that's not stranger in a strange land. That's a whole another trope. And then because uh, uh, he's he's an America Americanized Asian American who's relearning his culture. Okay, so that that is a a problem for many things. There is still less contrast between an Asian American Danny Rand and a Asian, and the real Danny Rand. Uh, if me and my Asian buddy somehow get lost in Indonesia, it doesn't matter, I'm still more of an outsider. I'm an outsider from a thousand meters away. And the other thing about uh, the Asian American kid who's lost touch with his culture, nobody, nobody keeps touch with their home culture better than Asians. No matter how Americanized your Asian friend Seems like he is when he's around you. Trust me. I used to live in a town that was 50% Asian American. Nobody keeps in touch better with their culture than Asian Americans. So that's just that's just fake. It doesn't make any sense, like, psychologically. The other thing is that everyone said, you know, uh, the, the idea of an Asian American superhero going to Asia and relearning his culture. Okay, Kurt Busiek, why didn't you make go make that comic? I, I posed that to him straight out. I said, if this is such a great idea, how come none of the established comic creators are doing this? Go do a Kickstarter for it. Now, actually, the Kickstarter will do okay because there's this... Kickstarter is really kind of a charity, and it's like, I believe in this. So there have been so many anthologies, and it's just like, gay superheroes, Asian super... And like, they actually do good. They make like 30,000, 40,000. I guarantee none of these books are being read. They show up a year or two later, and you go, oh, right on. <laughs> but Danny Rand, being a white American with blonde hair, is the ultimate stranger in a strange land. It also gets all. It also deflates the whole white privilege thing. It it twists it and it comments it on it and it also deflates it because I tell you what, no one had less privilege than white blonde haired Danny Rand in a mostly Asian mass, magical city that's basically a Guantanamo Bay boot camp style atmosphere. It's like. Hey, we fight all the time. You're going to get your ass kicked all the time. Hey, white boy. Uh, yeah, you're getting extra attention. Don't. It doesn't matter if you shave that blonde hair. Oh, yeah, you're getting some extra love every day. It's, it reminds me about uh, boot camp. Uh, I have people ask for advice, and I go, don't be bad, but don't be excel. <laughs> don't excel. If you are the best guy, your life is going to be hell. The, the worst time in boot camp is the best guy and the worst guy. It's best to just be in the middle. If your drill instructor has to like snap his fingers and try to remember your name, that's where you want to be. 
uh, Danny Rand did not have that option. He was always the the even when he was you know been there for five years and eating porridge and sleeping on a stone floor, he was still to everyone else the coddled rich boy who needed some extra you know shots to the you know kidneys. Um, so Danny Rand got really good at fighting because of racism. He got really good at fighting because of bigotry. And one of the great things about Danny Rand is that uh, as much of uh, bigotry and racism he endured, he went back to New York and he was the least racist person you could ever met. His best friend was black. He dated Misty Knight. He dated Colleen Wing. He was basically that the way that big city people and progressive people like to think of themselves, that's what Danny was. We saw this in um, the the Iron Fist show where, oh man, I, I, I spent all the time talking about cultural appropriation of the comic. Anyway, the Iron Fist show, I really liked it. It had a lot of issues. The, one of the biggest issues is, and it's not really the actor's fault, the actor was hired 15 days before they started shooting. He was literally learning the moves right before every shot. They would literally say, do this and this, and then he would do it. So those movies you see where Ben Affleck is in great shape, Logan, you know, Hugh Jackman is in great shape. Those guys had six months to a year to prepare. Wonder Woman, all of that. So um, the uh, Matt Murdock, the guy who played Matt Murdock, Charlie something, I'm blanking on it. Um, uh, he said flat out he didn't work out and he didn't prepare for it. He was just lucky enough to have a very lean, fit, toned body. And some people just have this. This kid who played Iron Fist absolutely did not. He was skinny fat. I don't know how. He had a 26-inch waist and he still had a little bit of a belly. Uh, it looked pathetic when he had his shirt off. And he could not fight. And you know what? I kind of loved him for that. Uh, back in the early 90s, they had all of these uh, uh, martial arts heroes. They had... Seagal, they had um, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme, they had Jeff Speakman, who looked like like a underwear model. Um, they had, uh, they even tried to do like uh, Van Peebles Jr., I forget his name. Um, and then, of course, they were still had uh, Walker, Texas Ranger. My favorite one was Jean-Claude Van Damme. And the reason I liked him is that he kind of sucked. He had this look on his face like he knew he, he, knew he kind of sucked, and he was really worried about you finding out. Whereas Steven Seagal was just completely arrogant. Jeff Speakman just looked like a professional speaker, no pun intended. Um, he looked like, you know, like a, a male model. Um, Walker, Texas Ranger, he was just, you know, he was like kind of like uh, the cliche, but people liked him. I like Jean-Claude Van Damme because he always felt like an underdog. He had like a knot on his head. Oh, by the way, it turns out that's not a knot on his head. I always thought that. I always thought it was cool that like it looked like someone just like... Hit him with a stick. Um, but it turns out that's just like this fatty skin deposit, which is kind of disappointing. Um, I thought it was actually like a dent on his skull. Anyway, that's what I liked about it. They, uh, the Iron Fist TV show actually really expanded on the uh, comic. And I actually think it's much better than the comic mythology. All those stuff, all that stuff with the, uh, the, the rich kid, brother and sister, and then their dad. Almost all of that stuff was entirely original to the TV show. And I consistently found that people who watch that think that that was the best stuff. I really liked how they had this thing where... Um, so I talk about in the comics, they're always denigrating rich people. And there seems to be a movement with the, the media to do that. I've, I've found that Americans tend to not hate rich people. They hate evil rich people, but they don't hate rich people as a class. So it was interesting to see rich people... Um, you know, shown that they had different, like with the, with the sister and the brother, like at first you go, oh, they're villains. And then they do something nice and you go, oh, they're not villains. Maybe they're heroes. And then, and then at the end you go, oh, they're people like they're, they're going to have, they have good aspects and bad aspects. They grew up in a very extreme, um, situation. Uh, but they were very, uh, fascinating. The other one that was a big revelation was the girl who played Collie Wing. Oh my gosh. She was so good, and um, she had a great personality where she was kind of like a classic New York tough girl, and you got to see her vulnerable side. I actually really liked the romance between her and Danny. Um, it felt very real, um, and it felt very much like a big city uh, romance. Uh, I, I found this kind of like the softer guy and the harder woman. That's kind of a common thing you see in the city. So anyway, I'm coming up on the limits of my phone. I was going to talk a lot more about the TV show, but I think... Uh, 
the, all the conversations about the TV show got monopolized by the cultural appropriation and comics aspects, so I guess it's kind of appropriate. Anyway, I liked it. It's my... Uh, I mean, I would put Iron Fist... This is how I would rate the, the Netflix shows. I would say Daredevil Season 2, Jessica Jones Season 1. Uh, okay, I'm, this is from best to worst. Daredevil Season 2, Jessica Jones Season 1, Daredevil Season 1, then Iron Fist, then me just staring at my hand, and then me staring at a block of wood, and then Luke Cage. So thanks for watching. Subscribe and hit notifications, and I'll have more videos up later today.